before. Going on as scheduled tonight to tell you how things are actually worse than you even suspected on the national level. I wanted to follow up what both Pete and Jesse were talking about, about you know, the connections with what's happening here in Washington and in Seattle. Um, I was having dinner you know, just now with a number of the stalwarts of the ACLU in Washington. And we were talking about, you know, Pete was talking about how it's sometimes hard in the face of fear to be rational, which is going to be my theme for the rest of the night. And I want to tell you that if it's hard sometimes to get it right in Seattle and Washington, imagine what things are like in Mississippi. So we really count on the ACLU of Washington as being one of the affiliates in a place where we hope that the states will serve as laboratories and that you will be able to get sensible laws passed, both in Seattle and in the state of Washington, that can then be exported because that's the only direction in which it's going to happen. It's not going to start in Mississippi. So anybody who is not yet a member of the ACLU of Washington, I'm sure Kathleen Taylor and the others here would be happy to talk to you about why it's so important that you do that. So now on to what I was going to talk about, which is my book that I wrote. And when you write a book, I don't know how many of you have had this experience, but the first question that everyone asks you is, well, why did you decide to write this book? So I thought I would start by answering that question, and this involves, <coughs> excuse me, allergies. Uh, this includes giving away the beginning of the book. Now, you're not supposed to give away the end of the book, but I think it's actually okay to give away the beginning of the book. So where this book started was I was having dinner, it was actually the summer before last, and seated next to me at dinner was a woman who was just an acquaintance, and knowing that I was president of the ACLU, she said to me, so polite dinner conversation, talk to the person to the left of you. She said, so tell me what the ACLU is doing these days. Pause. But don't tell me about that Guantanamo stuff. She said, I'm so sick of hearing about that. She said, why should I care about those people? They're not even Americans. OK, I'm hearing gasps. So some of you could have answered that question, right, why she should have cared about those people at Guantanamo. I have answers to that, too. But I actually started to think about the fact that she didn't think that any of the anti-terrorism measures and what we'd been doing since 9-11 had anything to do with her. You know, she knew she wasn't at Guantanamo. And therefore, she thought it just wasn't relevant to her life. So essentially, I wrote this book as an answer to her question, why should I care? And in the book, I don't take on talking about Guantanamo and torture and what just happened to Mr. Alawaki with you know, the targeted drone, all the things that happen on a global level. What I wrote about in this book, as Jesse was saying, reading Linda Greenhouse's blurb, was I wrote about the impact of the war on terror on ordinary Americans. So at the beginning, after telling the little anecdote, my opening anecdote, <coughs> about this woman saying, why should I care? Um, and talking about her assumption that this didn't affect her, I just say she's wrong. Um, and then I give a kind of a list of some of the kinds of things that I talk about in the rest of the book in terms of ways that this, the anti-terrorism laws after 9-11 might affect her. So let me just read you this list just to give you a sense of the scope of what's happened. I think people know the words Patriot Act. They think about something about surveillance and about the library provision, the librarians, which I will talk about. But there's so much more than that going on. She could be one of the hundreds of thousands of innocent Americans the FBI has been spying on using the broad net of the Patriot Act and supplemental powers. Her banker and her stockbroker, among many others, have collected financial and other personal data about her to lodge in government data banks, ready to trigger an investigation of her if the government happens to connect some dot of information to her dots, even if she's done nothing wrong. Her computer geek neighbor might be one of the innumerable telecommunications workers and librarians whom the FBI has conscripted to gather information on hundreds of thousands of occasions, perhaps about her friends or acquaintances, and then ordered not to tell anyone anything about their experience on pain of criminal prosecution. Her nephew could be the computer studies student prosecuted for providing, quote, material support to terrorists because he served as a webmaster for a website posting links to other people's hateful comments. Her son could be the college student detained and interrogated for packing his Arabic-English flashcards to study during a plane flight. She could find herself unable to complete an important business or personal trip because her name was incorrectly placed on a no-fly list or simply because she has a common name, like T. Kennedy. Her favorite charity could be shut down for years or even permanently because a government bureaucrat once decided to investigate it, even if the investigation went nowhere. Her generous contribution toward humanitarian relief might be sitting in government escrow for years instead of reaching the intended recipients or being returned to her. Her doctor's assistant 
could be the young Kashmiri American who was stopped and searched in the New York City subways on 21 separate occasions, even though the odds of the same person being selected for a, quote, random search that often have been calculated as one in 165 million. So that'll give you some sense of the range of the different kinds of things that have happened, not only under the Patriot Act, but under many of the other programs that have been begun since 9-11 itself. Now, as you go, I'm sure that you know, some of these stories are familiar to many of you. You've been reading individual things over the years about a surveillance program or a provision of the Patriot Act. Maybe you know the story of Brandon Mayfield, the Oregon lawyer who was not involved in the bombing of the train station in Madrid, but nevertheless was, um, had a terrible experience. But when you start putting all the stories together, what for me emerges is that there are a lot of common themes. And one of the common themes about a lot of the post 9-11 measures, including the Patriot Act, and not only the surveillance provision, is the idea of the dragnet. The idea that we're going to give the government all of these powers to do surveillance, to prosecute people, to do security screening, to do all sorts of things, all sorts of powers, just in case. Just in case we might thereby catch a terrorist who we otherwise didn't catch. Now, we all know that the very nature of a dragnet is that when you lay out a net that broad, you're also going to catch the unintended. But one of the things that's happened also since 9-11 is that as same, part of the same package of giving the, the government all these dragnet powers, we also bought into the whole idea that the government has to do whatever they're doing in secret. Because if we tell the enemy what it is that we're up to, then they're going to know our, our, you know our plans, and then they're going to be able to respond. So therefore, there has to be secrecy on the part of the government. And therefore, the saying goes, we had to just trust the government to do, you know, use the powers in the right way. OK, the dragnets are very broad. They could be used, as you'll see, to prosecute the Red Cross or to spy on anybody at all or to find out what people are reading in libraries. But it's OK, because the government isn't going to really want to do those things. They're really only going to use their powers wisely. And therefore, we should just trust them. Now, to me, when you think about this, the basic problem with all of these measures is that they turn democracy upside down. So it's not even just a matter of rights, which everybody talks about, and it's not even just a matter of some individual people who have had horrible experiences because of what's happened. But it's the whole idea that the government is deciding what's best for us, and we, the people, are being infantilized. You are not being trusted to make decisions because nobody's going to tell us what's going on. So um, I thought that maybe a good, as good a place as any to start the story, you know, since here I am in Seattle, you know, beginning my book tour of the West Coast, I thought I would start with you know, one of the things that happened in the state of Washington, which I think is just you know, kind of a perfect little emblem of the war on terror. So does anybody know where Whatcom is, W-H-A-T-C-O-M? Am I saying that right? Whatcom County, right. OK, Whatcom County. And is that far from here? North. OK, so if anybody knows about this, where that name comes from or whatever else, I'd be happy to hear about that later. I'd love to know. But see, here's an interesting thing that happened in Whatcom. In, um, I think it was 2005, there's a librarian there of the Whatcom County Library named Jean Eroldi. And one day, while she's going about her business in the library, an FBI person comes to her and says, OK, we want to know who checked out this biography of Osama bin Laden. She, being a librarian, says, say what? You know, I'm not going to tell you who checked out a book. Don't you know libraries are like, you know, that's where people go for ideas? You know, you're not supposed to know who checked out a book. That's confidential. So the FBI agent says, well, right, you know, if you're going to make me do that, I'm going to go get an order. So he comes back with a subpoena saying, OK, now you really have to tell me who checked out this book, you know, this biography of Osama bin Laden. Well, Gina Roldi sticks to her guns, non-guns, and she says, well, OK, you know, I've gotten my lawyer on the case, and we're going to go to court, and we are going to move to quash the subpoena, which is, uh, lawyer talk for no. <laughs> How many times do I have to tell you? I don't want to tell you that. So her claim is that this is a violation of the First Amendment. And she has, you know, she's really quite concerned about the idea that librarians can be forced to tell anybody what's going on. So this has led me to look at a little bit into the history of public libraries in the United States. And libraries turn out to just be the venue where intellectual freedom and democracy are born. So let me just tell you two um, stories about why libraries and, and librarians, I think, are so central to this story. So you all know Benjamin Franklin, right, one of the framers of the Constitution. There is a town in Massachusetts that decided to name itself after Benjamin Franklin while he was still alive. 
Now, the advantage of naming yourself after somebody who's still alive, apparently, is that you can make them give you a present as a blessing. So the people in, in Franklin, Massachusetts, wrote to Benjamin Franklin, and they said, okay, we're going to name the town in your honor, and you'd like, we'd like for you to please send us a new church bell to you know, kind of accept this honor and to, you know, to bless us. So a little while later, they get a big, heavy box, and they think, oh, good, you know, Benjamin Franklin has sent us our church bell. They open up the box, and it's not a church bell. It's a bunch of books. And Benjamin Franklin's note to them is, sense is better than sound. <laughs> so the first public library in the country, allegedly, is Franklin, Massachusetts, because they had to figure out what to do with these books, and they decided that a good thing to do with them was to make them available to everybody in the town, because that's clearly what Benjamin Franklin would have wanted. Uh, Franklin also started with his friends, the Library Company of Philadelphia, which was the first lending library in the country. And he was not alone. Thomas Jefferson, who was also very into books, had an enormous collection of books. So when the British burned the Library of Congress during the War of 1812, the way the Library of Congress started again was with part of Thomas Jefferson's collection. He just gave them some books so that they could start up, but he had that many. So librarians, including Jean A. Raldi, really have regarded themselves as being the custodians of our intellectual tradition. And the whole idea of the First Amendment is that if we're going to be part, if we're going to be the government, we the people running the government, we have to be able to formulate our ideas and find out what's going on. And that's been so many books have been so much a part of that. So when Jan, Joan Araldi refused to tell the FBI, who had you know, checked out this biography and gotten her, got her lawyers to go to court and protest, about two weeks later, I'm happy to tell you the end of the story, the FBI dropped the demand. So Joni Raldi is off the hook. But what she did instead, being a patriot and a true believer in the First Amendment, was she wrote a news article for USA Today explaining her story and, and what had happened. And you know, very interesting. So now you can read this story. Well, one of the things that Joni Raldi noted was that if the government had really wanted this biography of Osama bin Laden, they also, they, they, everything could have turned out quite differently. They could have prevented her from writing that story in USA Today. And the way they could have done that is that instead of getting a subpoena from a court, which is kind of a regular way to proceed, they could have used the USA Patriot Act. Now, you recall that in 2001, among the first people to protest, well, wait a minute, what's going on here with this Patriot Act, were the librarians. And the provision in the Patriot Act that was of concern to the librarians came to be known, actually, as the library provision, because they were the ones who brought attention to it. So let me tell you what the library provision says to give you a sense of what the Patriot Act was changing in the law. And I'm going to start by telling you a little bit about the Fourth Amendment. The Fourth Amendment, part of the Bill of Rights, says that the people have a right to be free from unreasonable searches and seizures. Now, according to the courts, what makes a search or a seizure, if the government wants to come in and search your house, or if they want to seize you, if they want to arrest you, what makes that reasonable is, first of all, they have to have a good reason to do that. That's usually called probable cause. So they can't just search your house because they feel like it. And in order to be sure that they really have a good reason, part two is they have to go to a court. They have to go to somebody neutral and say, OK, we want to search that person's basement, and we want to arrest that person, and here's why. And the idea is you then have a neutral court look at the information that the government has and say yes or no. And that's, you know, that's a second opinion. That's like if you think you want surgery, you get a second opinion. So that's the basic idea of the Fourth Amendment. Um, in order to try to keep privacy, let me actually step back one more step before telling you about the Patriot Act, because I want to tell you what the Patriot Act was replacing. The, Osama bin Laden incident that I was just telling you about in the Whatcom County Library was not the first time, the Patriot Act is not the first time that librarians were being asked to help with federal investigations. During the Cold War, there was a program called the Library Awareness Program in which librarians were asked to tell the federal government about any foreigners who were trying to check out books. And the basic idea was that that was a way to keep an eye on the Soviet Union, that if anybody was a communist, you could see what they were reading, and therefore you could tell what they were up to. Well, you know, the librarians didn't really like this so much, but it was a very deeply secret program that nobody was supposed to know what was going on until the New York Times broke the story in the 1980s. And at that point, there was such outrage that the federal government was going around to librarians and asking them about who was checking out books. Some of the librarians said, you know, we're librarians. How are we supposed to know, you know what, who, what foreigners are spies? So what happened in response to this incident is that 48 states 
immediately, passed laws protecting the privacy of library records. And what the laws said is, well, you know, you just can't get library records unless you get a serious court order. You have to have a reason, a good reason, you know, probable cause kind of reason, for wanting to see the library records. And number two, you have to go to a court. You have to go to somebody neutral and convince them that you're right. We, just, you know, we don't want you just being able to walk into the libraries. Okay, so that's kind of what end, ended up happening in Whatcom County. They got a court order and they went to tell the librarians who <laughs> weren't so happy anyway. Well, what the Patriot Act did was there's this one provision the quote library provision, it's called section 215. And what that says is it says that if federal agents want to get records from any third party custodian at all, anybody who has records about you, not only libraries, that could also be schools, it could be hospitals or healthcare providers, it could be social work agencies, it could be, think about this one, internet service providers, anybody who has any information about you, it says the federal government can get that information as long as they submit an affidavit, a statement to the secret court, this foreign intelligence surveillance court, saying, we think we're going to find something relevant to a terrorism investigation, and therefore we want to do this. What the Patriot Act says is if the government submits that statement to the secret court, the court must grant the order. Now, you notice, if you're you know, thinking of law school at all, you notice two things that are missing from that. Number one, you don't have to have any suspicion. You can be looking for the records of an innocent person because you don't have to prove that they've done anything wrong or suspicious. You just have to say, we want to look at their records because we think it might lead us to something. Number two, okay, it's a court order, but the court doesn't get to decide anything. The usual norm is supposed to be you have to explain to the court why you want it, and the court will say, oh, that makes sense, or wait a minute, you know, we don't think you're doing this right. Uh, how does that square with all these state statutes protecting library records? It doesn't. There's a supremacy clause in the United States Constitution, and federal law can just sweep away state laws that are inconsistent. So the whole point of the Patriot Act was to make library records, medical records, educational records, everybody, internet service records, all of them just available to the government without the privacy protections that almost all of the states, the two that didn't actually have laws, you know, did this in another way. But almost all the states agreed that library records should be special. Now, nobody ever said library records should be sacrosanct. You, know, you could get them if you really needed them, but there had to be this protection. Now, um, when the librarians first started to complain about the library provision for reasons that I, I think are clear, just the whole idea that you know, whatever you're thinking should not just be open to the government, some things should be private and should have this level of protection. John Ashcroft, who was the attorney general at the time, just, just started making statements that the librarians were being hysterical and that this was really silly. And of course, the government didn't care what people were reading. We should just trust the government. They were only going to use this power if there was a serious problem of terrorists. And of course, we should do that because you have to give up some of your liberty in order to be secure. So the librarians were a little dubious about this. So they just kept complaining because they just didn't agree that it was a good idea to just trust the government with this enormous power because that's exactly what the framers of the Constitution thought should not happen. You don't put all the power in one place. You have to have your checks and balances, as Jesse was saying. So when the librarians kept making a stink about it, they're not as quiet as their reputation. So at some point, John Ashcroft said, oh, all right, all right, I'm going to declassify information about how many times we've used this power, and I'm going to tell you we never used it in libraries, OK? Will everyone just be quiet now? So that was it. So the librarians were told they were hysterical. Well, one librarian, one nice thing about my book is I have pictures, and you won't be able to see this from here, but there's a very nice picture of a librarian in Connecticut named George Christian. That's George Christian right there. And so he's in Connecticut, and he's with this group called Library Connection. And he and some of his colleagues have been meeting in the fall of 2001 about the Patriot Act. And they're trying to figure out, OK, you know, what are we going to do if somebody comes to the library and says, who's checked out a biography on how to build a dam? Because what if they're a terrorist? Um, you know, before this had happened to Joan Eroldi. And when John Ashcroft says, well, we haven't used this provision at all, in, certainly not in libraries, he, he and his colleagues thought, oh, well, you know, okay, I guess we can relax about this. It doesn't seem to be a problem. Well, there were other librarians before Joan Eroldi, before George Christian, who were really scratching their heads about John Ashcroft saying, we've never used this provision, because in fact, they had had FBI agents come to the library and ask them for information. And they're thinking, well, wait a minute, you know, what's going on here? 
Well, it turned out that what was going on was there was another provision in the USA Patriot Act that nobody knew about called national security letters. Now, the national security letters went one step further than the library provision because they could be issued by FBI agents themselves, by themselves with no court order at all. They just get to do it internally. One FBI agent says to another FBI agent, I'd like to do this, and the other FBI agent says, sure, go ahead. And that's it. You know, there's no court, nothing like this. Now, the national security letters aren't quite as broad in the information that you can get. You can't actually get the contents of records, but you can find out all sorts of things about names and addresses and who, what, where. And if we're talking about internet service records, you can this has changed a little bit over time, but at least at some times the interpretation was that the FBI could find out all the internet addresses that you visited and all of your to and from email addresses. Now, even if they can't get the content of your emails, knowing everybody you're in touch with in every single site you visited is a lot of information. So if the FBI wanted all those kinds of information, all they had to do was go to telecommunications providers, telephone company, internet service providers, and this included libraries because have you been in a library lately that doesn't have a computer? Okay, so it covered all these people. So one day, George, Chris, uh, George Christian is standing across the street from the tennis courts in Mattatook, Connecticut, and an FBI agent comes up to him and serves him with a national security letter saying, we want you to turn over the following information about Connecticut library patrons. Okay, now George Christian, being a true patriot, always got that he wasn't ever going to tell anybody who the government was asking about. That could, in fact, compromise national security, because who knew? But what was upsetting to him was that when he gets the national security letter, first of all, it's not from any court. Second of all, it says at the bottom, it has what's called a gag order, that he is never allowed to tell anybody whatever, in any way, that he has received this, any kind of demand. He can't tell them anything about his own experience. The third thing that he thought was, well, wait a minute. He's now in the know. He's saying, well, wait a minute. John Ashcroft is telling everybody that they've never used this provision in libraries. You know, what's going on here? And he's not following, oh, it's a different provision. You know, it's just, you know, they're asking me for information about library patrons. So he goes to see a lawyer. And the lawyer for has never heard of national security letters either. But the lawyer, fortunately, has a law student doing research. And the law student looks this up and finds out that there has been a case involving, of course, the ACLU called John Doe versus Gonzalez, because by now we're on to the next attorney general, where there was an internet service provider who had challenged national security letters, including the gag order, you're never allowed to tell anybody, and who had won you know, his case, that the gag orders were unconstitutional. So at that point, George Christian was encouraged. He had now consulted three of his colleagues. He didn't want to do this by himself. So he was really taking a chance by telling anybody, including the lawyer, including his colleagues, but decided this was just really important. So they decided that they wanted to challenge the national security letters to challenge the constitutionality. But the first thing that George Christian wanted to do was he wanted to testify in Congress. Because by now, it was 2005, and the library provision was due to expire unless Congress renewed it. In October 2001, where the Congress passed the USA Patriot Act, they were in such a rush to do something about terrorism that they didn't bother to have hearings or debates or testimony. They just passed everything. And there were some provisions, including this particular section, section 215, that they thought were so controversial that instead of just putting them in the law, they said, okay, you know, we're gonna temporize a little here. This will be good for four years. And then unless Congress renews this, after four years, it'll expire. So four years had passed. Congress is now considering whether to renew the provision. And Attorney General Congress, uh, Gonzalez testifies in Congress, and he says, OK, we've only used this provision 35 times, and we've never used it in libraries. No big deal. George Christian is saying, wait a minute, wait a minute. But you know, he's telling Congress, he's leading them to believe that everyone's library records are safe. And I know that people's library records are not safe. I have no intention of giving away the government's actual secret of who they're investigating, but I want to say to Congress, wait, there's this other thing going on here. Are you aware of this? Yeah, this is pretty weird. So the government says to him, you can't say, you can't say that. There's a gag order. You're not allowed to testify before Congress. Well, so there are the library connections. So let me tell you now about the first person, the first John Doe who had decided to challenge the national security letters. Uh, when he first brought his lawsuit, his lawsuit was called uh, John Doe versus Ashcroft. Then it was called John Doe versus Gonzalez. Then it was called John Doe versus Mukasey. Then it was called John Doe versus Holder because the attorney general kept changing while his litigation was pending for six years. 
For six years, this guy was not permitted to say that he was the person involved in this litigation. Okay, you can imagine? So I've now gotten to meet him. The six years are over. I can now tell you his name. There's a picture of him in the book, and he's very proud about what he's done here. But when he first got this order, he had had a constitutional law course at Hampshire College, and so he was also very troubled by the fact that there's no judge's name on the order and by the fact that he was ordered never to tell anyone anything about the fact that the FBI had ever come to him. So he went to see, he was the first one really daring to do this, he went to see a lawyer at the ACLU, even though the, the, what he was told was don't ever tell anyone at risk of federal prosecution. No exceptions for lawyers, no exceptions for courts or Congress. And the first thing he said to the lawyer was, okay, so if I challenge the government on this, are, is somebody going to come and put me in a sack and drag me away? And the lawyer said, well, you know, actually, I can't tell you what's going to happen. You know, who knows? And so he decided he was just going to go ahead anyway. So for six years, he litigated this case. And just to give you a sense of what that means, imagine keeping that kind of total secret for six years. So this guy was pretty hard to hold down, so he wrote an op-ed an anonymous op-ed in the Washington Post in 2007 when he had already been litigating for years to describe what it was like to live under this you can't tell anyone. He says, when I meet with my attorneys, I cannot tell my girlfriend where I am going or where I have been. I hide any papers related to the case where she will not look. They ended up breaking up. She had a feeling he was hiding something from her. <laughs> when clients and friends ask me whether I'm the one challenging the constitutionality of the NSL statute, I have no choice but to look them in the eye and lie. Okay, well, I can tell you that, um, fortunately, this guy who we can now identify, his name is Nicholas Merrill, very brave person, and he actually now has another girlfriend and a baby, so he's doing quite well, thank you. But, you know, but for six years, he was living through this lawsuit. Well, when the Library Connection 4 decided to follow in his footsteps and bring a challenge to why, how come they couldn't talk to Congress, they went through the same thing. They became John Doe's. They weren't allowed to tell anybody. They wanted to attend the court hearing of the case that they had brought in Bridgeport, Connecticut. They weren't allowed to. They had to watch it from a closed TV in the courthouse in Hartford, you know, 60 miles away, because nobody could identify them as the people who had brought the lawsuit or that would have violated federal law. So uh, they ended up, the ACLU litigated both of those cases and actually won the library connection case. However, the government didn't give up and actually let the librarians testify before Congress until after the Patriot Act had already been renewed. So George Christian said, you know, it's sort of like calling the fire department after the house is burned down. So um, one question, I, you, know, you can see you know, you're not allowed to talk to Congress, you're not allowed to talk to a court or a lawyer. In fact, the gag order was slightly modified because after the judge in the John Doe case said, well, that has to be unconstitutional. What do you mean you can't tell a lawyer? The government can make any ridiculously oppressive demand and you're not allowed to say, wait a minute. So you know, that's been changed just a little bit. But um, I think one of the problems here that I think, one reason why I wanted to start with this story is I think it, it tells you a number of different things. Um, first of all, this whole idea of not being allowed to talk to Congress, of everything being so secret that the government just has to do what they want and we're not allowed to challenge them, the litigation was supposed to be secret, you, you can't tell anything to Congress, that, you know, again, to me, is just you know, democracy upside down. Now, people often ask, well, you know, okay, so, you know, you're all here tonight because to some extent or other you care about this, you want to know what's going on. But there are a whole lot of people who are not here tonight because they don't care. They are happy to assume that the government is doing what's necessary to keep them safe, and they wouldn't actually be happy if anybody were to say to them, well, you know, wait a minute, there are some questions about this, because they prefer to just let the government do whatever the government thinks is going to keep people safe. So just to give you a sense of that, uh, the litigation that the two John Doe's brought ended up with our actually finding out something about the national security letters. So there had been this whole thing that the Attorney General had been saying about how the library provision was almost never used, which was true for a while. The national security letters had been used more than a few times, however. You want to guess a number of the number of requests the FBI has made using this do-it-yourself, no court, no anything? More, more, more. Hundreds of thousands. Hundreds of thousands by now. So they've gone to all sorts of telecommunications providers, librarians, internet service providers, all sorts of people on hundreds of thousands of occasions. So imagine, you know, that could be you or your friends or whatever, people who they're finding out stuff about. But to me, the other very telling fact in terms of what we're up against is that out of the hundreds of thousands of recipients of these requests, you want to know how many people stood up and said, wait a minute, wait a minute, I think that there's a problem with this? So far as we know, six 
There's one other, in addition to the four library connection people and the first John Doe, there's one other um, internet librarian who's kind of debug, who also stood up. Now, you know, we don't know what other people have done because they're not allowed to say the American Library Association has tried doing surveys, but people aren't allowed to tell about their experiences. So we just don't know that much about what's happening. Well, okay, so one question that people sometimes ask, and I don't know if this has been occurring to any of you, is, well, why should I really care if the government knows what I'm doing if I'm not doing anything wrong? Now, I think there are people who, you know, the First Amendment teaches us that you should care if the government wants to know what you're reading, because that does have something to do with your ability to form ideas and really run the government. If the government knows too much about what individual people are doing, that gives them a lot of power over people. Because if the government just has vast stores of information on all of you, think in your own mind, don't tell anyone, just think in your own mind, have you ever done something that the government might consider suspicious, interesting, illegal? Those things on the tax form? Those, you know, whatever it is. <laughs> you were speeding, and you know, whatever. You know, most people, most businesses, most individuals have something. That, they, that would give the government some power to come after them if the government really wanted to. Okay, so once you give the government all this information to just have and hold and find out about everybody, even people who are not suspected of terrorism, you're just giving the government, you're reversing the balance of power. Instead of us being the government and having power over the government, you're giving the government the power to come after whoever they want. Why is that a problem? Well, there have been occasions on which the government goes after people for political reasons. They go after people who disagree with them politically. While George W. Bush was president, there were quite a number of cases where there were complaints that he was having the FBI go after people who had carried protest signs where he was speaking. You know, people who wore T-shirts saying, you know, we don't like George W. Bush, or you know, words less polite than that. Uh, there have been fewer complaints about that under President Obama, but there are still a lot of complaints, especially about state fusion centers where state people are, are working on these things too. Okay, so one possibility is political, you know, the government can use this in politically repressive ways, which is something that's happened in a lot of other countries. Government can also use this extensive power in arbitrary or discriminatory ways. Guess whose records the government is going to be especially interested in looking at if they're going to do any anti-terrorism investigations at all? A lot of the secret powers, not just surveillance, but everything else, have really targeted Muslims and Arabs. Oh, let's just see what they're up to. And the whole idea that you know, a quarter of the world's population could be suspect and you know, possible terrorists is, you know, doesn't make a lot of sense. But there's this possibility of discrimination. Plus, the other thing that happens is when you have all this power being used in secret with no oversight, there really are very likely to be abuses. So here's one thing that happened. So it's not until like 2005 that we find out about all these national security letters being used, and it turns out there are really a lot of them being used. Well, what the Patriot Act had set up in saying the FBI could use these do-it-yourself orders was they said, well, you know, we don't really need courts to look at this. That's okay. That's going to be too bogged down, and what if the courts say no? We don't need congressional oversight because, after all, that's too public, and what do we need Congress for? So what we're going to do instead is we're going to have more regulation within the executive agencies. So before the FBI issues national security letters, they should have regulations, higher officials should be part of what's going on, etc. So the FBI has all these regulations, here are our procedures and we'll do this and we'll ask these people and we'll have a second, whatever. So by the time Congress finally woke up and decided it might be a good idea to find out what was happening with the national security letters, they finally got this inspector general of the Justice Department to do a study on this. And the inspector general discovered that when the FBI was wielding all this power in secret and didn't expect that anyone was watching, they had violated their own regulations thousands of times. Thousands of times. They couldn't even follow the regulations they set for themselves. Plus, then the inspector general did another report that the government had become so confident that any time they went to like telephone companies, you know, like AT&T or whoever, to ask for information about who people had been calling and who they were getting calls from, AT&T would just say, yes, sir, and here's the information. And they had become some, so confident that everyone was just going to cooperate and say, sure, you know, that's fine, that they weren't even serving national security letters and following their procedures. They were making requests by email, and they were making requests by yellow post-it note. So, to me, it's a story of, you know, the, one of the, um, you, you know how people always put little quotes at the beginning of each chapter? One of the quotes that I have at the beginning of one of the chapters is from Jenny Holzer. You know who that is, the artist? And she has like truisms that run on an LED, like treat boys and girls alike, things like that. One of her truisms is, abuse of power comes as no surprise. 
And you know, abuse of power comes as no surprise. When you give somebody a whole lot of power and you let them exercise it in secret and they don't think anyone's ever gonna know what they're doing, that's like a real recipe for abuse. So, has all of this ended long ago when George W. Bush left the White House? Unfortunately, not really. Um, the last time this, these provisions of the Patriot Act were renewed, which is just this past May, there were two senators on the Senate Intelligence Committee, Ron Wyden and Mark Udall, who said to Congress while they're doing all this, they said, you know, we're on the Intelligence Committee, so we're not really supposed to say very much about this because it's all top secret, but the Obama administration is interpreting this library provision power in a way that we think is really twisted and would really anger the American people if it were known. That was May. Senator Dianne Feinstein said, oh, oh, you, well, maybe we'll hold some hearings on that. It's October. So Senators Wyden and Udall are still talking about this and saying, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, could we, you know. So it's still happening. There are still things that are happening in secret that the American people don't know. Um, in addition to the collecting all this information, the other issue that's a really big issue is the issue of the retention of all this information. Uh, you may have heard of this lawyer in Portland, Oregon, who I mentioned, Brandon Mayfield, who was totally exonerated. He, had, he was a totally innocent guy who ended up having a horrible experience because the FBI made a mistake in thinking his fingerprint matched another fingerprint of this terrorist thing that had happened in Spain. So they finally figure out that he's totally innocent because it was really some other guy whose fingerprint was on the plastic bag in Spain. Brandon Mayfield had never been to Spain. It was just, it was just a total mistake. So Brandon Mayfield brings a lawsuit against the government and he says, okay, well, you know, you have all this information that you've gathered from my family. They listened to like every telephone call of the family because they were suspecting something in Spain. It so happened that Brandon Mayfield's daughter was studying Spanish. And so the FBI kept seizing all of her homework and labeling it Spanish documents. And yet they were very suspicious, you know, all of her Spanish homework. Um, it really, the family had a pretty awful experience. The FBI agents would keep sneaking into their house to look around and copy the hard drive on their computer when they weren't home, but they weren't being so careful, so they would like leave the curtains closed where they had been open, where they would bolt the door where it hadn't been bolted, so the family would come home, and it was clear somebody had been there. So you know, how did they know? Burglars, FBI. So he had had this awful experience. So after he's totally exonerated, he brings this lawsuit and he says, okay, I think you got all this information from me and my family unconstitutionally, and so will you please give it all back and leave me alone? So the district court, this is in Oregon, the district court said, um, we agree, it was totally unconstitutional. The government said, oh, you know, maybe, but we're not giving it back. Once it's in the computers, it's in the computers. Tough. Okay, so here's what I think people don't know. They don't know the extent to which this is happening. They don't know about these hundreds of thousands of requests about how the government could be going to your internet service provider without a real court order and saying, tell us everything you know about this person. Think about it in these days of cloud computing. What does your internet service provider know about you? What are you storing up there in the clouds? All of your photos, all of your calendars, all of your contact lists. It's a lot of information. So, costs. Is this effective? What is the government getting with all of this information? Well, the whole theory is you have all this information, you can connect the dots. Well, any mathematicians in the group or scientists, you can't connect dots unless you have algorithms. It works for Amazon to figure out, and you look at all your data and figure out what books you're gonna like because we have algorithms for that. There are patterns to what people like to read. There aren't patterns to terrorism. So we're collecting all this information, and the Washington Post just did a series uh, we, uh, last summer where they referred to the government as drowning in data. So are we getting anything from all this loss of privacy and individuality? Not clear, not clear. Will the government tell us how productive this is? No. The Inspector General reports, where they were trying to figure out, well, is the FBI actually getting information from all these national security letters? Turns out, number one, they couldn't tell because the FBI wasn't keeping records that way. And number two, they mostly said, you know, we don't really see any cases where there are results except for this one possibility, black, 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 all redacted. So, you know, how do we know? Um, let me just mention two other areas quickly, just so you get an extent, a, a sense of the extent of what's going on and how this isn't only about surveillance. A uh, similar kind of thing is happening in the criminal law area. There are these statutes called material support laws. Now, if I ask you, is it a good idea if somebody gives money or guns to terrorists, is, should they be prosecuted for a crime? The answer is sure, right? And they can be. You know, if, if terrorists kill people, they can be prosecuted for murder and attempted murder and conspiracy and all sorts of things. 
the material support to terrorism laws were meant to add to the government's possibility of prosecuting people in cases where, in fact, you hadn't given guns with any intent that anybody do anything. But they really got broadened during the Patriot Act. So they do two things. They say you can't give material support to either any group that the government says, oh, they're terrorists, forget them, or any individual who, in fact, the government suspects of being a terrorist. What they did um, in the, the Patriot Act was they eliminated any exception for humanitarians. Okay, think about that for a minute. If the Red Cross is giving money to people or aid to people or food in a war-torn part of the world, are they likely to be dealing with terrorists? It's very possible. There's a lawyer with the ACLU of Northern California who has, whose family happened to live in Sri Lanka. So he was in Sri Lanka for a vacation when that big tsunami hit. And so he was trying to help out with the aid efforts. And it turned out that at that time, you know, there was this civil war in Sri Lanka. So this, this group called the LTTE, the Tamil Tigers, and they were running a fifth of the government. They, were, you know, they had seized a fifth of the country. So if you wanted to get aid to people in that fifth of the country, you had to deal with the Tamil Tigers. There was no, they were the government. There was no other way to get the aid out. Under American law, you can be prosecuted for that. That's providing material support to terrorists. The theory is, oh, the money is all fungible. So if you give food to you know, the Tamil Tigers you know, to give out to people, then they're not going to spend their own money on food, and therefore they're going to be able to spend their money on bombs and be terrorists, and therefore you're helping the terrorists. Do we care if that's what you meant? No. So you could give a contribution to a group that's, that's running a very nice nursery school, but if the terrorists use the money for the nursery school, then they're saving their money and they can use their money on bombs, and therefore we can convict you of providing material support to terrorists. Okay, big problem, right? So there have been a number of people prosecuted under this statute in ways that are really alarming. I tell the story in my book of a graduate student who ended up being prosecuted for providing material support to terrorism because he posted links on a website. He was a Muslim, and he was part of an effort to try to help people understand more about Islam. So he posted all sorts of information, and to be fair, he, because people were interested, he also posted some links to people explaining why they thought jihad was a great thing. Okay, so the jury, this was in Idaho, he was at the University of Idaho as a graduate student, and the jury in that case, having a crash course in the First Amendment, said, wait a minute, wait a minute, you, know, you can't convict a guy of a gr crime for posting links to somebody else's speech that's hateful. As the lawyer said to the jurors, you know, if you could prosecute him for material support to terrorists for that, then you could prosecute the New York Times for publishing an op-ed by somebody from Hamas, and you know, where does it end? You were supposed to be able to listen to what people have to say. The um, other group that became very concerned is this group called the Humanitarian Law Project based in California. And what they were trying to do, they're peace activists. And they tried working with you know, would-be terrorists to try to convince them to use peaceful dispute resolution means instead of terrorism. So they were talking especially to the Kurds in Turkey. who You may know the Kurds have some complaints about the Turkish government. So they were trying to teach them to go to the UN and use alternative dispute resolution methods instead of you know, starting acts of terrorism. When the Patriot Act was broadened, was broadening the uh, material support laws, um, one of the things, in addition to eliminating totally the exception for humanitarians, the Patriot Act also added a category of saying, well, you can also be a criminal if you provide expert advice or assistance to terrorists. So the people at the Humanitarian Law Project became alarmed. They said, oh, is somebody going to be considering us to have provided expert advice or assistance? So their case ended up being litigated all the way up to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court's answer was, yeah, you're covered by that. Yeah, they could prosecute you for that. So next question, does that violate the First Amendment? The court says, oh, no, that's okay. The government needs to do that because we're fighting terrorism. You know, you do have to give up some liberty in order to be safe. They said... Is this about whether people can talk to terrorists? Yes, but you know, whether you can talk to terrorists, that depends what you want to say. The idea of the statute is make to make terrorists radioactive, and therefore, government knows better than you do. Nobody can talk to the terrorists. Final example, which I'll talk about if you're interested in this. Actually, let me give you two quick vignettes, and then we can see what you want to pick up on during the, the Q&A. Um, the charities, another theory in the fall of 2001 was that terrorism was being financed because there was a pipeline going from mosques in Brooklyn, where people made charitable contributions, directly to al-Qaeda. So that was the theory. Using that theory, the Bush administration shut down just about all the major Muslim charities in this country, period. Completely unfair, and you know, that's a whole other story. But then, you know, there still, 
even under the Obama administration, they're still shutting down charity. You know, there's this one charity that they've been trying to keep shut down. Just, you know, they just take all the money. And at that point, another pretty horrifying story to me is that the charity, once the government decides to freeze the charity's money because they have it under investigation, the charity is not allowed to use its own money to hire a lawyer. You have to ask the Treasury Department's permission if you want to represent a group that's being charged with being a terrorist, so they can't even fight it unless they somehow come up with some other money. But who's going to give them money when all their money is just in escrow? They're not allowed to spend it. Which means all those people who were giving money to a charity because they wanted you know, children in Lebanon to have food and toys, their money is just sitting for years, years, in the government coffers, and it never gets to the people who need the aid, and it never gets back to the donors. So this is a problem. And finally, um, I'm interested in people's airport experiences too, but here to me is just you know, another little vignette of what's wrong with giving people too much discretion. A college student, 22-year-old college student named Nick George, he's a senior at Pomona in Southern California. He's become interested in Middle Eastern studies. He's majoring in Middle Eastern studies, and as part of that, he's studying Arabic. Nick lives in Philadelphia, so in August, he's flying back to California for his last year of school, and he decides to, it's a pretty long plane flight from Philadelphia back to Southern California, so he decides he's going to study his Arabic-English flashcards while he's on the plane. Okay, <laughs> you see it coming, right? TSA agent sees his Arabic-English flashcards and says to Nick, who was 14 at the time, he says to Nick, do you know who did 9-11? And Nick says, Osama bin Laden? And they say, yeah, you know what language he spoke? Do you see why these cards are suspicious? Five hours, they had him in a cell at the airport. They interrogated him. They had all sorts of people coming in to question him. He missed his flight. He was pretty terrorized. So Nick George ended up as a client of the ACLU. OK, so that should give you a sense of range of what's happening. So I'm going to now invite all of you to question or comment. What do you want to talk about? What questions do you have? What reactions do you have? Sir? Yeah, you made a comment about the contributions to a charity like the Red Cross um, for food. Um, and then if that gets to a terrorist organization, you could be prosecuted. I believe that law was changed because I think the, the government understood that there was unintended consequences that that was happening. And I believe that recently, that law was recently changed so that you could give charities as long as, you could give the charities as long as your intention was not to give to no, it doesn't depend on intention. What they did do, they, one of the laws that depends on whether you're giving to a charity that is designated charity, is it requires that you know that the charity was designated as a charity, but the evidence uh, that was designated as um, a, a blacklisted charity, right? So you know, you, if you don't believe, not that reason, and it was not changed to you know, to make your intent matter. The intent does not matter. It does matter whether or not you knew that the charity was on the blacklist, but they can prove that by circumstantial evidence. And it just, let me actually give you another example of a pending prosecution, just to, you know, to tell you about this. Uh, one woman who I write about, Roya Romani, it's a pseudonym. She was, was um, a woman who lived in Iran. And being somewhat older, she was alive while the Shah was still there. And one of the chief opponents of the Shah was this group called the PMOI, which you know, initials, which you don't need to know what it stands for. Anyway, they were the, um, some of the chief opponents of the Shah, and they were really agitating for a democratic government. So the Shah was finally deposed, and democracy did not come to Iran. You know, it's now run by the mullahs with this very religious state. So she was concerned. She thought the country was going to be democratic, and it didn't happen. So she continued to support the PMOI because she thought that they were going to oppose the current government, and then things would be better. And the current government was not so happy with that political opposition, so it ended up, you know, she ended up being put in jail for several years under horrible conditions. So finally, they let her go. She was jailed for the crime of waging war against God. So she left Iran and ends up you know, seeking political asylum in the United States and is given political asylum. So while she's here, she's living in Los Angeles, and she decides that she's going to spend her time helping other Iranian refugees. So she's working with this committee that's working with Iranian refugees, and the committee has some connection with the PMOI. So the State Department designates the PMOI as a terrorist group. And 20 months after she gets to LA, she is arrested by the FBI while sitting in a Starbucks in LA and charged with the crime of materially supporting this pro-democracy group. Now, her theory was that she had only good intentions. She's trying to help Iranian refugees. And she says the PMOI shouldn't have been designated as a terrorist group to begin with because it's not a terrorist group. It's a pro-democracy group. <laughs> 
as a number of other countries have recognized. But this, this, the designation happened under Bill Clinton because the government wanted to be able to negotiate with the government of Iran. And one of their conditions for negotiating with us was that we designate their political opponents as a terrorist group. Okay, so she's tried in California, and what she wants to say to the jury is this isn't a terrorist group, it's a pro-democracy group. You would think that would be our goal, to have democracy in Iran. The courts say, no, she's not allowed to say that. The government is conclusive. You know, once they say that's a terrorist organization, she's not allowed to challenge that. And we don't care what she intended, if she was just intending to, you know, to help refugees. And you know, so the, the circumstantial evidence is, did she know it was a designated group? Well, they had circumstantial evidence where they said, well, you know, she seems to have been trying to hide the fact that she knew these things were connected with those things. So it's still going on. That appeal is still pending. So, yeah, unfortunately, the, the uh, charities had all banded together. They had a Treasury Department working group where they were trying to work first in the Bush administration and then in the Obama administration to try to make things easier for the charities. You know, the Treasury Department could, after confiscating assets, they could release the assets to another group that they had no concerns about, but they don't do it. And so the Treasury, th th there was this Treasury working group that kept meeting and meeting. When Obama came in, they really thought things were gonna be better. In December, they gave up. They just said, you know, that nobody's interested in change. You know, Congress has not changed the law. You know, the law was changed in actually a different direction to allow proof of the knowledge of the designation of the group to get you on the hook. Other questions or comments, ma'am? Do we have any idea how much this costs? Oh. <laughs> It costs a lot. I was just citing, you know, it's you know, billions and billions of dollars. I just read the figure. You know, I'm not sure exactly where this is from, so I'm just giving it to you with the grain of salt that I just read this figure, that we spend more on anti-terrorism measures, on national security, than all the other countries in the world combined. Combined. So we're spending an incredible amount of money. Well, that's you know, one thing that people do say, and you know, there's a whole you know, kind of public-private partnership that is going on, where there are companies that are definitely profiting from this. So I think you do have to you know, consider the profit motive, consider the way in which the government is interacting with private companies. But I think another question that I think your, um, lead, that your question leads to is, what are we getting for all that money? Right? And uh, what we're certainly getting is more negative impact on individual people and on civil liberties and democracy that I think most Americans realize. But the question of, you know, are we doing things that are effective? Yeah, there are real reasons to be concerned about that. I was saying about the surveillance and whether or not we have the algorithms to really figure out. We have all this data, but you know, what good does it do if you don't really know to recognize patterns? The um, campaign against the Muslim charities, there's a really interesting report that the ACLU did called Blocking Faith Freezing Charity in 2009. And it was all about you know, the interviews with a lot of Muslims all around the country. And the campaign against the Muslim charities really led to a situation where the FBI is infiltrating mosques. That's something that's happened on the West Coast, too. You know, the, San Francisco is really looking at this now, and what's happening in the mosques there. So the FBI infiltrating mosques, going door to door to talk to Muslims who make contributions to different charities, even including charities that were not blacklisted. Why did you give to this charity? Then they would come back the next year and say, you gave to that charity again. Why did you do that? So there are Muslims who are really feeling seriously intimidated because you know, they feel like you know, if they give any money to a charity, it's one of the pillars of Islam, they're supposed to do that, but they're afraid the FBI is gonna come down on them, so some of them stop giving to charity or they try only giving in cash, and they become really afraid of the FBI. And one of them says, you know, the FBI should be working with us you know, to get us to help, to get us to explain to people about Islam, and to get us to identify people who are concerned to us, but instead they're really alienating the community. So there are some studies now showing that in addition to some of the things that we're doing certainly being wasteful, some of the things that we're doing may actually be counterproductive. And that's the conversation that I think after 10 years of doing all the same things, that's the conversation we should be having. Sir. Yeah, sorry, I'm moving away from charities. I have a question about um, the American human who was assassinated for women. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, what extent do you think the rights of an American are protected in a situation like that? Okay, great question. Um, this is something that the ACLU had actually brought a lawsuit even before that happened on behalf of Mr. Alalaki's father to say an American citizen should not just be shot in some place that's not a theater of war without our knowing a little bit more about what process is leading to the designation of somebody as somebody who should be killed. You know, one thing if it's not an American, when Osama bin Laden was, was killed, he's not an American, he doesn't have constitutional rights. 
Mr. al Laki, as an American citizen, does have due process rights. So even if we have a fair amount of assurance that in fact he was a really bad person and was inciting people to commit acts of violence against us, our concern at the ACLU is that once you have this secret process going on where we don't really know how those decisions are being made and how people are being identified to be killed, once you start that, you, where does it end? At some point you're gonna designate somebody by mistake you know, who in fact was innocent plus there's gonna be collateral damage. So I think it's very concerning. This isn't what my book is about, you're right, but I appreciate the collateral question because I think there are really some common themes. One thing I talk about in my book is the, um, some of the lists, the watch lists, the no-fly lists. I'm sure you all know about the no-fly lists. Those two, the way that people get on no-fly lists, it's all secret process, it can be by hearsay, and there are some things that are big mistakes. So here's the kind of thing that goes on. There's one guy who I talk about here, lives in Pennsylvania, he was a Gulf War veteran. When he was in the Gulf, they were giving him sensitivity training to understand about Islam and what you shouldn't do wrong while you were there. So he became interested in the religion and ended up converting. So after he um, left the service, he was a commercial pilot. And one day his boss says to him, okay, we're gonna have to fire you if you can't get off the no-fly list. We can't have a pilot who's on the no-fly list. Okay, so he ends up bringing a, a lawsuit. And it turns out one of the very interesting things in the court papers is that one reason why the um, FBI focused on him, one reason why apparently he was put on the no-fly list, was that one of, his one of his co-workers, not his neighbors, one of his co-workers who knew he was a Muslim was just really suspicious. And so he reported to the FBI that this guy, Eric Scherfen, his name is, that Eric was retrofitting his car to carry bombs. You know what led to that suspicion? He removed a broken seat from his car. Now, you know, if that's how you get on the no-fly list, and you know, that can be really serious. The ACLU has a case. I don't think that we have any clients in Washington State on the, the banishment case, do we, Kathleen? Okay, I know there's somebody in Northern California. But there are a number of Americans who are overseas who are effectively banished from the country because they've been put on the no-fly list for reasons they do not understand, and they can't get home. So you know, it can be really serious. So you know, that's what happens when you have things happen in secret with no oversight. So you know, maybe this really you know, was a, a bad dude, and you know, certainly he committed crimes, but to just say, you know, he's an enemy, we can kill him, you know, very much of concern to us.